the youngest member of our Bible study. Christos Hades Etoel, and welcome. I would like to welcome a new member as well, uh, who has come from Halifax. New Brunswick, sorry. I knew it was the Maritimes. So I, didn't, I didn't know where exactly. So welcome. It's uh, Wail. All right. And I thank you from Jordan originally. Very good. You know, in Jordan, most of the services are done half Greek and half Arabic, right? And they belong to the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. Right? So we'll get a chance to speak afterwards as well. Yes, Jordan belongs to the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Alexandria is Africa. All right. So we lived the most intense liturgical period of uh, our calendar year. The one with the most services, the one that is the most beautiful, I would say, all services in our church are beautiful, but especially Holy Week and uh, Pascha uh, really stand out as liturgical gems of our church in the way that we celebrate them. We try to imitate what would have been done at the very places where all these events took place. So if you go to Jerusalem and you see how the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate there does their services throughout the Orthodox world, we try to imitate what has been done there for centuries as well. And so what I want to do tonight is, uh, besides uh, perhaps getting your feedback on what you experienced, I'm always looking for ways of how do we improve our services, our outreach for those who come. You know, we clergy have a certain expression for those who tend to come in great numbers for certain feast days. Uh, they are known in the trade as the C's and E's. And I'm not referring to the exhibition, I'm referring to the Christmas and Easter crowd that come. Um, so, how do we get all these people that, we had over a thousand people that had a Pascha. How do we get these people to keep coming back and not just come once a year or twice a year or three times a year? That's the big problem. The other big problem we have in the Greek tradition, which you don't see in the other Orthodox traditions, is the mass exodus. As soon as we've said Christos Adesti, as soon as they receive the light, out the door they go. As if, you know, the food is not going to be there waiting for them when they get back. It'll even taste them even better. I don't get home and I don't have my, my soup until 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, we survive. But you're on such a spiritual high, food does not make that much of a difference for us. If the content of your feast is simply on what you're going to eat afterwards, and you put so much stress on the lamb that you're roasting on the spit, you've totally forgotten about the lamb of God that is on the altar table, slain for us. And these are not my words. These are the words of St. John Chrysostom, who says, uh, if you cannot recognize Christ in the Lamb of God, in the Eucharist that we receive as our gift and His gift to us on Pascha, then the material food and the Lamb on the spit and all the rest of the foods basically mean nothing. If this is the content of your feast, it's a very materialistic and very earthly feast. The true meaning of the feast, of course, is to be found here in the church and in receiving the Blessed Sacrament in feasting on the Lord, we sang throughout, late, throughout Lent in the recent of our liturgies, O taste and see how good the Lord is. Yefsaste ke idate oti Christos, o Kyrios. So maybe before I get into the Bible study, in case we have a few people who are going to be late tonight, your uh, feedback. What touched you again this year? And as I stated at the beginning, it was such a blessing to see the church full again after two years of not being able to celebrate Pascha again with uh, our family, our spiritual family here. So it was a great blessing to be able and uh, to meet you people that have come from far away as well. So um, your comments.
You can tell me in confession afterwards why you were not here Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. <laughs> All right, all right. I was a bit disappointed with the crowd on Thursday night. I would thought we would have had more. There's still a concern, certainly about the pandemic out there as well. Um, how much the live streaming affects attendance, that's probably an issue as well. I have to tell you that uh, uh, for the first time we had over um, 2.7 came, so 2,700 viewers for Pascha, 2,300 viewers for uh, the Epitaphios on Holy Friday, uh, 2.1 for Holy Thursday, the Gospels, 2.1 for Palm Sunday, so those were the big services, of course. And from what John Prochettis tells me, our uh, techie, and please say a prayer for John because he deserves it. He sits, he sits back at every service and controls the cameras from his own computer at home. So we all owe him a debt of gratitude for that. So when you see him, thank him because we have something here as well. Eventually what we're going to have to do is get a team together to help John out and is comfortable with uh, maneuvering uh, computer cameras and sitting. I mean, we have the studio upstairs. It's uh, all the information, all the, the, the uh, equipment is there for it. But before we get to that topic as well, just to finish off Holy Week. Sorry. Any other comments? Okay, hold on. We'll get put on the back burner. Anyone else? John? The Lord hung on the cross for six hours, and we couldn't make it for those out. I should make you feel guilty you're here tonight. <laughs> okay. We'll see you in confession. Okay. Anything else from here? All right. I'm always open to suggestions, so kindly email me. Let me know your thoughts, and there's something that we can uh, apply by all means. We're here, we're here to obviously um, respond to the needs of our community. I don't think we've ever done even a study to see how many, uh, let alone the Greeks, let alone how many Orthodox. You know, our guest found us just online to find out which close, what is the closest church to where he is. Uh, living, and here we are. Okay. But again, the other issue is um, I'm always trying to find the right balance in terms of using language. How much English? How much Greek? So, obviously, our dieharders uh, would prefer it in Greek, not because for any reason that they, that they uh, understand it, because it's nostalgia mostly. What does the younger Anta lega me olesta aglika. Titalius. We try to strive for half and half on Sundays. Okay, weekdays when we have mostly an older crowd, it'll be, it'll be primarily in Greek. We 
we're trying to find the right balance. Costa. So, God of value. Part of the issue, of course, is trying to do hymns in English. It's all translated. It's all done. It's the matter, are the cantors comfortable and able to chant in English? So, it's a different story to speak English, to preach in English. I have no problem with it. I was able to kind of, uh, uh, in the school that I went to, we were trained both to chant and to speak and to preach in both languages. I mean, this is how we need to reach out. But then, I've got a music background, so it helps, okay? Um, you know, don't expect from Costa, our older chanter, to do anything in English. It's not gonna work. Costa, the younger one, you know, I am encouraging him even more to do it. But interesting, I took a uh, straw poll, so to speak, from our young people during our retreat and uh, our metaphotis, I was surprised to hear the fact that they prefer things in Greek. I said, but you don't understand Greek. <laughs> so why do you prefer it in Greek? Because it sounds, it touches me here better. I says, okay, part of what we're called to do as the church is to offer what St. John Chrysostom referred to as loyiki latria, which means that Worship has to be reasonable, logical, and able to be understood. This was the whole point. Um, having said that, the, the church always used a higher level of Greek in its services. It wasn't the spoken Greek of today. Would have been more closer to the Kini Greek that was spoken at the time of Christ and the early church fathers. Perhaps they would have understood it a bit better. But the fact that the church services has been done in Greek, in the, what they call the Kini Greek of the time, Kini means basically the common language of the time. The fact that it was the church hymns and the liturgy was written in that language, that has tend to moderated the um, progression of the Greek language, so to speak. So, if you've gone to school in Greece or to high school, you should be able to understand a good 75 to 80% of the, of the service, right? Interesting enough, those who come from Cyprus, those who come from uh, the northern part, even Pondus, for that matter, have a better grasp of it because their dialect of Greek is closer to the biblical. Okay? And so there's certain words that we still use in the biblical readings that they still use in their vernacular, which is interesting. So um, part of our challenge as clergy is how do we reach the most number of people without estranging or estranging the ones that come and uh, fill the pews and help us out. So the books are coming back. Yes. I have them, I make them the, from the blue ones. Remember these were the church tires? Yep.
small world. Remember, we're still coming out of this pandemic cloud, so to speak. So we hope to be back to normal with the way we were, hopefully, by about the fall. But uh, be patient, we're getting there. If, from what I heard last night, at least things seem to be going down. So keep your prayers on that. If I may be so bold as to ask our guest, what was uh, your experiences here for the first time in our parish? Seasonal, yes. Because you're a minority. And this is what keeps you your identity as Christians. And that's what the church is meant to do. It's meant to be a home, a spiritual home. So we're very happy that you found us as well. You had your mother with you as well. She was visiting. How did, your, how did your mother feel visiting with us? Whatever. Good. Welcome. All right. Shukran for that. Yes, yes, yes. It comes from the Syriac Abba. Abba is father, of course. So Abuna is the redact, like Papuli is what we say in Greek. Right? I will call you Stephanos from now on. Very good. So, because of the, of the conditions, you don't use your Christian name in society there. 
Yes, of course. Does it mean something in Arabic? Aha, okay, good. Shukran, Stefanos. Welcome. Baba. Thank Bob Ray for that. Yes, a sore point with me. <laughs> so I thank you for your comments on that. So we are here for spiritual nourishment, and I wanted to go through the account once again of the events that we just celebrated, but to give it more of a theological uh, understanding about what happened and how this fits into the prophecies from the Old Testament and what do we get from today? So we're going to start with the, the trial, actually, because the trial is very important. Um, note that there were two trials for Jesus. One was the religious trial in front of uh, the high priests of the Jews of the day. And remember that the high priest accused him of blasphemy, for he made himself equal to God as calling himself the Son of God. Now, the penalty for blasphemy in the Old Testament was death. But of course, the Jews at this time are an occupied country and race. They had no power to put anyone to death. That's why they had to deliver him to the political authorities. The governor was Pontius Pilate. But again, the Romans would not put him to death for a religious reason, for blasphemy. They could care less. It was not there. Because remember, in the Roman Empire, the only other religion besides the Roman religion of the pantheon of the gods was Judaism. They only allowed Judaism to, to exist there because of the people. If you were not Jewish, you had to sacrifice to the gods and consider the Roman emperor as divine, as God. That had to be worshipped. And that's why so many early Christians were put to death because they refused. They couldn't on conscience. Our God is the one true God. We cannot worship and place incense before the representations of your false gods. And that's why we have so many early martyrs of the church. So let's start with the religious uh, trial, and I'm reading from Mark chapter 14, starting at verse 53. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. So you had all the religious establishment here. And the apostle Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. So you can deduce that it's cold in the evening. It's probably uh, spring. Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death. When did they finally make the decision to put Jesus to death? The decision was made after the resurrection of Lazarus. Once the early, or once the Jews saw the resurrection of Lazarus, instead of rejoicing, instead of recognizing this is the promised Messiah, this is the one who came, this is the one that we are to call our Lord and our God. Instead of rejoicing, they make the decision to put him to death at that point. The first time we hear this at the resurrection of Lazarus. So now they have it in for him. They're fighting, they're trying to find an excuse to put him to death. And Lazarus as well, because now, of course, Lazarus, the fact that everybody knew he had died, everybody knew he was buried, everybody knew that he was dead in the tomb for four days. That's what we call him in the Greek tradition, Otetraimeros Lazarus, the one who was four days dead in the tomb, to make that point. 
So, verse 56, for many bore false witness against him, and their testimonies did not agree. So, you can see that they're trying to get people to make up charges, and they couldn't agree with each other because they were false. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him again, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with the hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. So even still then, they couldn't agree on what he said and what he meant. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you not answer anything? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? For the other accusations, he didn't say a word. But now when he's asked point blank, who are you? Who do you say that I am, that you are? Jesus said, I am. Now the English doesn't make sense unless you know the Greek original. Remember we talked about the three initials on the halo of Jesus. Look up at the top. Omicron, Omega, Ni. What do those initials mean? It comes from the words that was spoken by God to Moses out of the burning bush. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. When Moses said, Who are you? And the voice said, I am who I am. Ego i mi o on. That o on is the title of God in the Old Testament. This is how God self identifies Himself. And why does the iconographer put those three initials in the halo of Jesus in every icon to identify that this Jesus is the very same God who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush of Mount Sinai. And so interesting, when the high priest asks him who he is, he responds with the very same answer, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Father and coming with the clouds of heaven in glory. Well, the high priest at that point just went ballistic. Because in his mind says, who does he think he is? He's a simple human being, and he wants to make himself God by saying, I am, by using the Holy Word of God. Remember that in the Jewish tradition of the day, nobody could utter the name of God. Nobody. The chief priest once a year, when he went into the Holies of Holies, that's it. And even then, he wouldn't even say it or lie, he whispered it softly, because it was so sacred and holy. And to this day, the Jews never would say or write the name of God. I remember when I was in university, and I took a philosophy course, and uh, the professor, uh, Dr. Bloch, was a uh, Orthodox Jew, the whole thing, the, uh, the skull cap, the whole thing as well. Any time, and it was a philosophy of religion course, he would never write the name God. It would be G slash D. Now, I didn't know this at the time, so I, I finally went up and asked him, this is Dr. Block. I noticed whenever you write the word God, you never write it. Is there a reason for that? He says, yes, as a, uh, as a Orthodox Jew, we are not allowed to even write the name of God, let alone say it. So, it's a tradition that some of them, at least the, the more conservative Orthodox Jews, still maintain to this day. Costa. So, they have another name for it. It's, um, it's Al Shaddai. I forget what the Hebrew is. I used to remember it. But they have another name for it, so they're not, they don't say the holy name of, of, of uh, God. So the fact that Jesus here identifies himself with that same name of God that God revealed to Moses is very important. And in the English translation, most people miss it. But if you read the Greek, you would have seen it. Ego imi. Exactly. And so when Jesus says, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Father, of the power, and coming with the clouds of heaven, Jesus' answer, this is the footnote here, is a revelation of the mystery of his person. I am is a direct answer given only in Mark. 
So it's unique about the Gospel of Mark. The word power, dynamis, is a substitute for the name of God, which pious Jews would not pronounce. There's your answer. Okay? So, the right hand of the power, the name, so instead of saying the name of God, they use the word power. So pious Jews would not pronounce the name. Jesus' bold declaration that He, the Son of Man, coming in glory, will share the authority of God, brings the charge of blasphemy and condemnation unto death. That's why He's condemned religiously now by the Jewish establishment, because He makes Himself equal to God. Verse 63, Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? Why did he tear his clothes? Because the blasphemy was so apparent, and for a Jewish ear to hear this, this would have been like the worst blasphemy that could be uttered against God. And tearing his clothes was a sign of utter, basically, uh, that this is despicable. This is, how could he do this? So by the symbolic act of tearing his mantle, the high priest shows his belief that Jesus is guilty of blasphemy. Thus, according to Jewish law, which under Roman domination, the priest could not enforce, remember. This is why there had to be a political trial as well, which we'll get to. Jesus is sentenced to death, and that's based on Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16. He who blasphemes God is to die. Though the charge of blasphemy will not be mentioned before Pilate. So, of course, they knew very well that Pilate would never put a member of their race to death for blasphemy because they could care less about their religious laws. They had to find a political excuse, and that's coming. Then some began to spit upon him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. So he begins to be abused. Now as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and said to him, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But Peter denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying to me. And he went out of the porch, and then he heard the rooster crow. Remember, our Lord had told them, you will, Before you deny me three times, the rooster will crow. And the servant girl saw him again, and began to say to those who stood by, Surely he is one of them. But Peter denied it again. And a little later those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. A second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he heard this, he turned away and he wept. His guilt. So of the remaining faithful disciples, Peter and John alone have the courage to follow Jesus. Peter denies the Lord, but at least he is there to do what he can. His intentions are commendable, but his strength fails, and he does not betray his relationship with Jesus. But when he thought about it, he wept. What can we say here? It's a very human reaction. All of us fail. Peter bursts into tears of repentance over his denial. But as we see, he will be restored back to his authority later on after the resurrection. Immediately in the morning, so I'm reading now chapter 15 of Mark. Immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. So obviously they had to find an excuse that would stick so that he could be put to death. Because they couldn't do it, the Romans had to do it. So they had to do their dirty job. The Sanhedrin want to reach the official decision in the morning, probably because by law sessions at night were not allowed. 
So it is enough. If you condemn somebody to death in the Sanhedrin, you couldn't take this decision in the evening. You had to be in the day, during daylight. Pilate is the Roman procurator of Judea. So this council is greatly deluded. They think that they are going to take away the life of the Son of God. But Jesus said, Therefore my Father loves me, because I laid down my life, that I may take it again. One thing to remember about all of Holy Week, we should never think that all this happened to Jesus, and he couldn't help himself. Any moment he could have walked away. As he said, I can call on how many legions of angels to come to my assistance, and he could have helped. But the whole theological point of Holy Week is this, that Jesus Christ willingly takes up the cross to die, willingly goes to Calvary, willingly is crucified. And this is why, as I mentioned before, when you look at the icons of the crucifixion in the Orthodox iconographic tradition, you note that it's not a body just hanging there listlessly on the cross. But you look at the form of Jesus on the cross, it's as if he has gone up on his own, that almost he's supporting himself. Look at the cross on the top here. You can see that somehow, even that figure of the cross there, that he's supporting himself. And the theological point the iconographer is trying to make here is that Jesus is in control of his destiny. Nobody else. Jesus controls what's going to happen, even to the point of the crucifixion. He willingly undertakes and undergoes death for us. So Jesus is delivered to Pilate, and as I said, Pilate could care less about the religious squabbles of the Jews. He's a politician. Then Pilate asked him, are you the so-called king of the Jews? And Jesus answered and says to him, it is as you say. Interesting enough, when he's asked point blank who he is, his identity, he will always answer. To false accusations, he would, did not answer. See, Epos is the Greek. It is as you say. Note that this is not a religious question. It is a political question that Pilate is asking him, to which a positive answer would be tantamount to treason against Rome. Jesus answers indirectly, it is as you say. And the chief priests accused them of many things, but Jesus did not answer anything back to them. So now he's before Pilate. He could care less about what the religious Jewish establishment has to say. It is not that Jesus answered nothing to any of the charges. He does indirectly acknowledge being the king of the Jews. And he affirms that he is the Christ, the son of the blessed, but against false charges, he makes no defense. Then Pilate asked them again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate began to wonder. Now at the feast, the Romans were accustomed to releasing one prisoner to the people, whomever they requested an amnesty. And there was one person named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. So there's a rebellion that had taken place. Barabbas was one of the leaders here, and he's considered one of the high prisoners here in their care. So these are Jewish nationalists who have already participated in some form of local insurrection against the Romans. Barabbas means the son of Abba, or literally the son of the father. A variant reading in Matthew 27, 16 has another name for him as well. And this tradition also attributes the name Jesus to him. Thus underscoring the bitter irony that the false savior and the son of the father, Barabbas, is released, whereas the true Savior and the Son of the Father, in truth, is condemned to death. 
Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask Pilate to do just as he had always done for them, to release one prisoner. And Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Ironically, I'm sure. For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over out of envy and jealousy. So Pilate was not stupid. He understood what was going on here. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call your king, the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him. Crucifixion was considered the most lowly form of punishment for the lowest dregs of society. If you were a citizen of Rome, as you know, you would be crucified, you would be beheaded. Remember, Paul, the apostle, was a Roman citizen. When he was killed, he was given the choice, and he was beheaded with a sword. So the top citizens get a less painless death. One, and you're out. Crucifixion is horrible, painful. It's the worst form of, um, of torture you can undergo at this time because from how they crucify you and you receive what the effects are, that basically you, you drown in your own fluids in your lungs because of the fact that you're constantly on your feet trying to support yourself out of the pain. And eventually, of course, you'd be exhausted. You could no, no longer further support yourself and all these fluids would assemble in your lungs and you'd be basically asphyxiated. But it would be a very painful end. And the fact that he was on the cross for six hours, crucified at the third hour of the day, the third hour is 9 a.m., and he gave up his spirit at the ninth hour, which is our 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Okay. So Pilate knows that they've given up Christ out of envy and jealousy. So the people want him to be tortured, basically, to undergo this horrible death. Then Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried all the more, Crucify him, crucify him. So Pilate wanted to gratify the crowd, release Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had him scourged to be crucified. So the Jewish establishment gets their way, they convince Pilate to put him to death, to do their dirty work. The envy of the Jews brought Jesus to Pilate. The cowardice, though, of Pilate allows envy to have its way. How pathetic is Pilate, known in history by billions of people for his complicity in this dreadful act. Perhaps the greatest coward of all time. Scourged, as you know, means to be whipped with a Roman whip. And what did this consist of? Several leather strips with small pieces of bone on the ends and lead at the tips so that they tear the flesh as he's being whipped. It was not a painless whipping. Part of the answer is found in the other Gospels of Matthew and Luke. And there, it talks about the, a riot is beginning to, be, to break out. So he's, he's scared of political, basically, revolt against the Roman power. Any politician, especially somebody in his position, you know, wants to keep the peace of the people so that Rome doesn't get alarmed. Because, of course, he owes his position of authority to the emperor in Rome. If he can't control the people, he will be dismissed. And interestingly enough, the tradition states that he was dismissed very soon after that as well. Christ could have, if he wanted to, Christ could have taken control of this whole situation and saved himself.
He gave in to the want, to the needs of the people. Christ certainly knew that it was going to be played out like this, certainly. But again, he's still in control. If it wasn't Pilate, it would have been somebody else. Same thing with the uh, person of Judas, who betrayed him. All right? But what does Judas say? It was better if this man had never been born. All right? Hypothetically, we usually don't deal in those questions. God knows. Some of the theologians do speak about the, the, uh, the person of Judas. If Judas had not hung himself and begged for forgiveness, I'm sure that he would have received it. All right? He lost hope. He judged himself. He didn't allow God to judge him. He judged himself, and he found himself worthy of death. All right? If he had not done that act, if he did not lose hope in the loving mercy of God, I'm pretty sure he would have been forgiven. But we don't know 100% even if maybe Christ did, because we say Jesus is the only man who was ever born to be crucified and died. Jesus is the only, the correct way of putting it, Jesus is the only man born that was born to die. We are born to live. Yes. But woe to them that they still used their free choice to betray him. Again, remember, we don't have all the answers in the Bible. As tempting as it is to kind of think about what would have happened, you know. Remember, what is in the Bible is all the information we need to be saved. What we need for our own salvation is here. Everybody's resurrected, it says. Those who have done good are resurrected to eternal life. Those who have done evil are resurrected to judgment. Basically, what is the, the orthodox depiction of, of the resurrection, as we see? It's the shattering of the gates of Hades. And by the way, we don't call it hell. Hell is something else. It's known as Hades, Hades in Greek. So basically, it would have, the, the Hebrew would have been the word Sheol. Basically, it's where the souls were imprisoned. All right? What Jesus did in descending into the nethermost parts of the earth, as the hymns say of our church, is to shatter those gates. That's why the icon of our church, the resurrection, we still have Thomas here, but uh, where's the resurrection? If you look at the small resurrection up there, the third from the end, you'll see Jesus basically trampling down on the gates of Hades, symbolic of the shattering that the prison is now obliterated. And in some of these icons, you even see the figure of Satan bound with chains as well, and he's underneath the gate so that he's trampling down upon the enemy. So our understanding of the resurrection what took place on the, on the seventh day, in the day of rest, of course, that God, this is why the Sabbath day is the day of rest, but the Sabbath day is also the day of rest for Christ in the tomb. But as the body, as his body is dead and resting in the tomb, the soul is very much alive and freeing those who respond to his message. Not everybody did. All right? Remember, what is left for judgment? It's the love of God that judges all of us. Some of us will respond to that love by loving Jesus back. These are the people that will be with him because they want to be with him. They've used their freedom to want to be with Christ. But others will use their freedom to reject Christ.
they still feel the love of God because God still loves them as well. But the difference is, whereas those who wanted to be with Christ, wanted to be with God for the rest of their life, for eternity, they experience this love as joy, as blessedness, as peace, as mercy. The ones who reject Christ in this world and also in the next will also be loved by God to eternity, but the love will not be pleasant because this love will be for them experienced as pain, as suffering. Why? Because they've rejected the source of love, the source of this sense of peace and love and mercy. So it's two sides of one coin. Those who wish to be with Christ will be welcomed with open arms. Those who wish to not have a relationship with Him, God will also respect their decision. That is the love of God for everyone. Costa. Very good question. Many saints of the church dealt with that question. What will God do with those who have never heard His message of love and mercy? What will He do with those of other faiths? The Muslims, the Jews, the Hindus, the Buddhists. We can't answer that. That's up to God. Having said that, there are certain saints that believed in the apokatastasis to abandon, as they say in Greek. It means that all people will be, saved, will be saved at the end, no matter what. The most famous would be Origen, who was the father of many of the fathers of the church. They are based on him. The one who is a saint of our church that held this view, his icon is on the wall behind the altar. One of the great saints of the church, St. Gregory of Nyssa, also believed that. But he's a saint not for that teaching, but for being the brother of St. Beals the Great, who basically finalized his brother's teachings into the works of the church. So some of the saints of the church did believe that everybody would be saved no matter what. But certainly these are just theological opinions. We call this in Greek theologumina, opinions which are not sanctioned by the church. How does the church decide on what is orthodox doctrine? There's something called Consensus patrum is a Latin term that means what is the consensus of the majority of the bishops of our church? So basically, what most believed at all times, throughout all ages, so that you have people like Basil the Great, John Chrysostom, Gregory the Great, the theologian, would be teaching exactly what Gregory, Pala they lived for a century, they would be teaching exactly what Gregory Palamas taught in the 14th century, exactly what the fathers of our church taught in the 20th century. So in other words, truth does not change because truth is truth. Ultimately, who is truth? For us as Orthodox, truth is not a what. It's not a philosophical uh, construct. Thank you. All right? Truth is a who. It is Jesus Christ who said, I am the life. I am the resurrection. I am the truth. So we look at Christ as being the truth incarnate, the living truth. So we would hope that God will have mercy on those. We would hope that if there's a, some way that they can also repent. As the Bible says, you know, the Lord rejoices over one sinner who repents. We can do no less on that. But to us, to whom the truth has been revealed, much will be asked again because we are responsible for that truth. What do we do with that truth in our lives? We're responsible for it. Again, where does that come from? The fact that we're all made in the image and likeness of God. All right? That image can never be deleted no matter what we do. Even the worst evil person in history, the Hitlers of the world, the rest, they're still made in the image of God. But they still have to 
Cultivate the likeness of God, and that can't be forced on you. You have to work at it. The likeness is to bring yourself in harmony with who God is and to fulfill your life as the way that God wants you to live your life. So part of our Christian uh, vocation is to find out what is our vocation in this life, to find out what does God want us to do with our life. Not everybody's meant to be a priest. Not everybody's meant to be a nun. Not everybody's meant to be, um, you know, to serve the church in the ordained capacity. But all of you belong to the priesthood of believers through the virtue of your baptism, as St. Paul says. You belong to the royal priest of the church, Vasilion Eratum, I call it in Greek. The royal yes, the royal nation. So all of you have received that dignity through your baptism. So you have your place. So it talks about all the various vocations there. But the point is, is that we're called as Christians to harmonize our lives with the will of God for us. That's why we put special emphasis on the Lord's Prayer, let thy will be done. So your prayer every day, ask what you're going to ask in prayer, but always say at the end, not as I will, but as you will. That's the proper orthodox way to pray. In other words, God, don't give me what I want, because for the most part, <laughs> my judgment is only so clear. You know best what I need and what I want. Let your will be done, not mine. You'll be very surprised what happens when you start praying that way. All right, Costa. Yes. Not even. It, I believe it. For them, it's it's a witness of who God is. They don't have a personal sense of who God is. Perhaps Stephanos can help us on that because he knows more about uh, the Muslim understanding of it. But it's a very different concept, construct from ours. We believe in a God who's revealed Himself to us. That's what we sing every matins. God is the Lord and has revealed Himself to us. Theos Kyrios, Kepephanen, Imin. We believe in a God who chose to reveal Himself to us in Jesus Christ. The God of the Jews, the God of the Muslim, is, in a sense, a God that has not revealed Himself, but has revealed basically rules about how to live your life. And you're called to submit to that. This is essentially what my understanding of what Islam is, that you submit to their rules, of what life should be. The problem is, how do you interpret that? Am I far off from uh, my understanding? He's a messenger, a prophet. Okay? So for us as Christians, there's no other prophet after John the Baptist. This is why he's called the greatest of the prophets. For us, with all due respect to the Muslims, for us, Muhammad is a false prophet. All right. So politically correct, you don't say that out there. But basically, this is what our faith has, has said. Um, and those of the saints who had any contact with Islam, John of Damascus, had debates with them. He actually referred to Islam as a, as a heresy, a Christian heresy. He said, what they did is they've, they've, they've picked and choose from the Christian and the Jewish texts and come up with their faith. All right? Gregory Palamas, when he was arrested by the Turks, remember, and held hostage for a year, he had the chance to speak with them as well. And he also referred to it as a heresy. All right? That what do the doors represent? They are the, the, the gates to paradise. So for that Easter week at Pascha, the, the doors of the altar remained open. Every day during Bright Week, Bright Week is what we call the week after Pascha, it's considered as one continuous celebration of Pascha. So liturgically, we celebrated the feast day of St. George in the Greek tradition. Whenever the feast day of St. George, April 23rd, falls 
in Lent, we always transfer it to the Monday of Bread Week, of Holy Week, of, sorry, of Paschal Week, to celebrate it with the grandeur of the feast. So we're the only tradition that does it. The, the, the Russians will celebrate them, even if it's in Lent, by the Greeks, for whatever reason. And of course, the Patriarchate of Jerusalem also does the same thing. The difference there, of course, is this, the Patriarchate of Jerusalem follows the old calendar. So all the set feasts are 13 days behind. So for the most part, St. George will always fall in the Paschal period for them. But on the new calendar, it would usually fall during Lent. That's why they transferred. So we celebrated St. George on Monday. We celebrated St. Raphael, Nicholas, and Irene, these new martyrs from Mytilini, who were martyred by the Turks, just their icons, of course, in the corner there. They were martyred just after the fall of Constantinople. And it's enough, they were hidden, they were forgotten until they started appearing to the islanders of Mytilini in the late 50s and early 60s and wanted to be revealed so that people could get to know them and to ask for their help. And they've become great miracle workers since then. On Friday, we celebrated the life-giving pont, another uh, smaller feast of the Virgin Mary. And we celebrate the many miracles she performed through her church in uh, Baruchli of, the, of Constantinople. This is a unique kind of Greek celebration because it's connected with Constantinople. The Russians don't know it as much. So these are local feast days as well. The Russians, and even the Serbs and the Bulgarians would have other feast days that are unique to their own churches. Right. So the point I want to make is this, all last week, the doors remained open because it was considered one continuous celebration of Pascha. And liturgically, on that day, on those, for those liturgies, because it's considered the same liturgy, the priest does not do the same prayers for his vestments. He would just put them on, because they were already blessed at that Paschal liturgy, so it's a continuation of that. So it's, it has some rather unique liturgical uh, traditions that week. Let's get back to the text so we can finish and get to the resurrection. <laughs> All right, how are we doing on time? All right, 20 minutes. So Jesus is now condemned by the political establishment in Pontius Pilate. And by the way, the wife of Pontius Pilate is considered a saint of our church. She's commemorated as a saint. Why? Because she ultimately believed and even warned her husband, have nothing to do with this righteous man because I've suffered much because of what's going on right now. And I believe there's only one Orthodox church that even has sainted Pontius Pilate, that's the Ethiopian church. They're in the minority. <laughs> None of us have done that. All right, so the soldiers led Jesus away into the hall called the Praetorium, and there they called together the whole garrison. So he's now beginning to be mocked, to be tortured. So the whole garrison is called in. The Praetorian is the residence of the Roman governor. Pilate may have resided either in Herod's palace or in the fortress Antonina, near the temple. So here, now Jesus is mocked and tortured. The mockery by the Roman soldiers includes the salute, Hail, King of the Jews, a parody of the salute to Caesar. It is astonishing that the King of Kings humbly condescends to be shamelessly treated as a criminal. Once again, he's in full control. He could have escaped any minute he wanted to, but he went through it willingly for us. One cannot help but grieve for those who abuse Jesus, for most of them also will reject the reality of his resurrection and his victory over sin and death. And they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns and placed it upon his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews, as if they would salute their Caesar, Hail, Caesar. Then they struck him upon the head with a reed and spat upon him, and bowing the knee, they worshipped him. You can see the parody here. The real king, the real God in front of them. And they're mocking him and doing all these things to make fun of him. But in, in actuality, what they're doing is correct because he is the king that, and the God that needs to be worshipped. Of course not. We're getting there, we're getting there. Patience. And when they had mocked 
Jesus, they took the purple off him and put his own clothes upon him and led him away to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. So when this was written, Alexander and Rufus had to be well-known persons, or else they would have mentioned. What does the comment say down here? So the fact that he's compelled signifies the right of the soldiers to press civilians into service, so they could choose anybody. Cyrene, that is from Cyrene, a city on the coast of Libya, North Africa, where many Jews had lived. Simon has the unique privilege of helping the Son of God, weakened by flogging and whipping, to carry his cross to Golgotha. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, translated to be the place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he refused to take it. This is important. Why wine mingled with myrrh? It was meant to be basically to try and uh, numb his feelings, to numb basically what he would be feeling. It was a sense of, of basically uh, trying to knock him out. It's important to note he refused to take it. He underwent that torture, that pain, to its full degree. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now this is also important because it fulfills prophecy from the Old Testament. That they divided his garments was a right of the squad of executioners. It also fulfills the prophecy of Psalm 22, 18. And we're going to come back to that Psalm in a minute. Twenty-five. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. So we know that he was crucified in the morning at nine o'clock, nine a.m. And the inscription of his accusation was written above: "The King of the Jews." Of us he left, study of their own. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right, the other on his left. The inscription on the cross was in accordance with the Roman custom of indicating the official charges against the prisoner. Whereas the Jewish authorities condemned Jesus for blasphemy, for making himself God, in Roman eyes, Jesus dies as a potential political agitator. St. Paul writes, none of the rulers of this age knew for they had known, for if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The ancient Jewish historian Josephus defines robbers in Greek listes as insurrectionists, that is, militant nationalist Jews who fought against Roman authorities and especially against Jewish collaborators. So the scriptures might be fulfilled which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross, and then we will believe in you. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking amongst themselves, with the scribe said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. So they knew exactly what he had done, but we, we see here, out of envy and jealousy, they had given him up, because he was a threat to the Jewish establishment, the religious establishment. This is the hour of greatest scandal, a seeming triumph for the chief priests and the scribes, but one, as we know, will be very short-lived. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Verse 33, now when the sixth hour had come, the sixth hour is 12 noon, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So for three hours, there's this, what well, most astronomers would say that there'd be an eclipse. So there was darkness over the whole land for three hours in the midday. 
When the Creator suffers, the creation suffers with Him. The lights of heaven hide themselves and are darkened until the ninth hour, as one of the hymn states, as God hangs suspended upon the cross. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cries out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated as, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Most people reading this would think he's lost all hope, that he feels abandoned, that even he feels not that God the Father can help him. Nothing can be further from the truth. Remember what I said. He is in complete control. What is he saying here? He is quoting Scripture. He is quoting the words of Scripture here. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Comes from Psalm 19. And so, sorry, it's Psalm 20. Let's go back and see it. It's the first verse. So it's worth looking at this psalm. It is 22. That's what I was just thinking right now. Here it is, Psalm 22. So as a pious Jew that would know the psalms inside out, Christ is quoting from Psalm 22, the very first verse, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? The whole point with the psalm is this, that it starts this way, but it's a psalm of trust in the Lord that he will be delivered from God the Father. That's why he's quoting it. So those who don't know Scripture will read, will read this verse and say, ah, Christ loses hope. Again, nothing further from the truth. Remember, he's in complete control. He's quoting Psalm 22 here, and this psalm is a song of hope in ultimate victory in God. So he's putting his hopes that God will avenge and will deliver him, and the victory is still his in God the Father. Some of those, verse 33, 35, sorry, some of those who stood by when they heard that said, look, he's calling for Elijah, when they hear Eloi, Eloi. Then someone ran and filled a sponge filled with sour wine, put it upon a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down from the cross. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. So the last words on the cross were words of prayer, quoting Psalm 22, God putting one's hope ultimately in God's will for him. What you would expect of the Son of God. So Jesus cries out with a loud voice and breathes his last. Verse 37. The Greek verb for breathed his last or expired connotes a voluntary death. Jesus' death is that of the suffering Messiah, whose cry is not a defeat, but a sign of the separation between the soul and the body, a turning point towards the triumph over death, the trampling down of death by death. So his victory begins at that moment. In the other scriptures, of course, he's also quoted as saying the words, Teteleste, it is fulfilled. What does he mean here? What is fulfilled is his mission. What he came to do on earth is fulfilled with his crucifixion on the cross. So the last words, as quoted by Matthew and Luke, are Teteleste. It is fulfilled. I have completed the work I was sent into the world to do.
And so the Greek word for giving of the spirit of breathing is less is exepnipsen. All right. And the root, of course, is pnevma, spirit. And so that he voluntarily gives up the spirit again, showing that he is in ultimate control. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So what is the effect now of God dying on the cross? Because that's how we refer to it in the hymns of the church. God dies on the cross, and what happens? Immediately, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. What is the veil? It's the curtain. In memory of that veil of the temple, we have also that curtain that goes across. It usually is left open, or should be left open. It wasn't tonight, but it usually is left open for the 40 days uh, between Easter and Ascension. So that veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple was torn in two. What is that significant of that now? The Holy of Holies is no longer there. But God, it is bereft of the presence of God because God is on the cross and he's just died. The divining wall of hostility, separating man from God, is symbolically represented by the veil of the temple, which was torn in two by the death of Jesus. So when the centurion who stood opposite Jesus saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was a son of God. There were also women looking on from afar, among those among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less and of Josie and Salome, who also followed Jesus and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So these are the murmuring women that we will commemorate, in fact, this coming Sunday in church. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day for the Sabbath day, late Friday, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. So a very courageous thing to do because he's not considered a criminal. He was just put to death. Anybody going to claim his body will be considered to be a co-insurrectionist. So not all members of the Sanhedrin, and that's what Joseph of Arimathea was, are opposed to Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea is an exception, as is Nicodemus. Joseph was waiting for the kingdom of God, sympathetic to the message of Jesus. According to tradition, Joseph went on to evangelize the British Isles. So he's considered to be a patron saint of the British Isles, in fact. Pilate marveled if Jesus had already died, and summoning the centurion, he asked them if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion that Jesus had already died, he granted the body to Joseph to be buried. Then Joseph bought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen. And he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb, now Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Josie, observed where they had laid him. So this linen shroud that he was buried with, the burial custom was to start from the feet and the shroud went right over to the back. Not to get into it tonight because it's a whole topic, but the famous shroud of Turin that may claim to be the burial shroud, I just saw something Again, that the New Testament shows that it is, in fact, 2,000 years old. It could very well be the shroud. In fact, most people think it is. Why? In fact, this shroud was kept in Constantinople. And it was folded, and you would only see the face of it. So the epitaphios that we use in every Orthodox church is meant to be a depiction of that shroud of Jesus in the tomb. And this shroud was 
displayed in Hagia Sophia once a year on Good Friday. Remember, from the year 1204 to 1261, the Latins had taken Constantinople and they basically stole anything of value, anything of religious value. So that's why today even the crown of thorns supposedly are in the chapel of the cross in Paris. Many of them ended up in France for some reason because of the, uh, the um, crusaders. So this shroud, um, many people think in fact is the one that was taken from Hagia Sophia by the crusaders and ended up going west. But again, that's another story. For us as Orthodox, the epitaphios we put in the tombs on Holy Friday is a, basically a replica of that shroud. And on it is the icon of Christ, of course, uh, laying in the, in the grave. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, this is the gospel we read the night of Pascha, the 16th chapter of uh, the gospel of Mark, the very last one. So they bought spices that they might come and anoint Jesus. What is this custom? The custom was that for the first three days, the Jews would go and anoint the bodies of the, their dead relatives. So they would not go on the fourth day because after the fourth day, this was considered the day that the body began to corrupt. The prophecy is that the Holy One of God will not see corruption. That's why he is risen on the third day and not the fourth, because on the fourth day would have corrupted him. All right? So they go to the tomb with the spices to observe this religious tradition. So at least some of the members or the mothers of Jesus' disciples were involved in his life and ministry. Mary, the mother of James, is probably the mother of James the son of Alphaeus, also called James the Less, one of the twelve disciples. Salome is probably the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, two of the twelve important disciples. They bought spices, aromatic oils, when the Sabbath was passed. So when is the Sabbath passed? The Sabbath goes from sundown to sundown. So the, sun, the Sabbath would have started Friday evening at sundown, and it was over sundown on Saturday, the Sabbath day. So when the Sabbath had passed, we're talking now in the evening of Saturday. Out of respect for the Sabbath rest, the anointing the body, but not in Bami yet, was a Jewish custom. The women seek to fulfill this custom in their courage, exhibiting their great love and devotion for Jesus. In contrast to the scattered disciples who are hiding out of fear. They are rewarded by the honor of being the first to, win, to be eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Christ. So very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, Sunday morning, very early, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away and it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be afraid. And by the way, this is the most common expression in the Bible, do not be afraid. You see Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, he is risen, he is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples, and Peter, into seeing that Peter is separated from the other, that he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Could you imagine now? They get this news, they're petrified. What has happened? They're told by an angel, go and tell his disciples, he is risen, he will meet them in Galilee. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, Jesus appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. There is 
a certain tradition in the West about Mary Magdalene as being a prostitute, as being basically uh, a woman of the streets to whom Jesus, in fact, revealed himself. This is not in the Orthodox tradition at all. We're not sure where this came from. It's probably uh, kind of a uh, kind of a, a union of two different traditions. But all the Orthodox Church said about it is what we read in Scripture, that Mary Magdalene had been possessed by seven demons that were cast out of her. She had formerly been ill, she was healed, and now became a disciple of the Lord. So she went and told those who had been with Jesus as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that Jesus was alive and had been seen by Mary Magdalene, they did not believe. Why? Because they would not accept the testimony of a woman. And that he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country on the road to Emmaus. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they sat at table. It's very important, the fact that Jesus appears to them during a meal. Because, remember, the liturgy is meant to be a Eucharistic meal, where we feed on the Lord. It's in this context of a meal that Jesus appears. And he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And these things, or these signs, will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons, one of the powers given to the priesthood. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Another of the traditions of the church of placing hands upon those who are ill over the Petrichidion, the stall of the priest, to read prayers of healing. So all, these, all this authority has been given to the priesthood of the church. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into the heavens and sat down at the right hand of the Father. So this is the ascension now that St. Mark speaks about very, very loquaciously, if you will. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Now, the Gospel of Mark is the earliest Gospel written. So it's very basically, uh, uh, it's only had, it has 16 ver uh, chapters to it. And it's considered one of the synoptic Gospels. The synoptic Gospels are the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Synoptic means basically it's the, it's the historical Gospels. And each of them is unique because it shows a different kind of um, Another, if you will, you've got three persons testimony to the same events. On most of the key points, they agree. There's some minor differences, for example. Whereas um, Mark speaks about the crucifixion about 9 a.m., the third hour, John, the theologian, mentions it closer to the sixth hour. So, a different perspective. Now, in the church, from Pascha to Pentecost, we are reading from the Gospel of John. We started at the first Paschal liturgy with the first chapter of John, in fact, the prologue of John. And we read, of course, about the Thomas account that we read this past Sunday, where Thomas is not present when Jesus appears to the eleven, and he says, unless I see him with my eyes, and unless I put my finger into the print of the nails, unless I put my hand in his side, I will not believe. That was the first day. Eight days later, that's why we call it Thomas Sunday. Jesus appears again, knows exactly what Thomas was thinking, turns and says to him, come Thomas. We have the icon here. 
come, put your fingers in the print of the nails. Put your hand on my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. Now, the gospel doesn't record whether Thomas took the challenge and tested him out, but the iconographic tradition tells us that. You see the icon here of Thomas, that indeed he places his hand right at the side, and then he makes that wonderful confession of faith, my Lord and my God. This is the confession of every Christian. If you call yourself a Christian, this is what you need to believe about who Christ is for you, that he is Lord. The term Lord is the translation of the Greek Kyrios, which in turn is the translation of the Hebrew. In fact, Yahweh, again, the name of God, that now, remember I said the Jews could never mention the name of God, it was so, so holy. And as Christians, now we have the blessing to name him and to pray using his name over and over and over again. What is the shortest prayer in the church? Two words, Kyrie eleison. How often we use that in church? We're calling God by his holy name and asking him to have mercy upon us. The fact that he is God, Theos, Kyrios mu Theos mu, my Lord and my God. God is the Lord and has revealed himself to us, we sing every Sunday in church. So, the interpreters of the scripture of Thomas saying, this is the last beatitude. What are the beatitudes? The makarismi in Greek, the ones that start, blessed is he. And so, this is the final beatitude, because Jesus said, Thomas, have you believed? Because you have seen me, blessed are they who believe, yet have not seen me. And he's talking about all of us, and every generation of Christians who have believed, yet we have not seen with our physical eyes, but we have seen with the eyes of faith. And that's what makes the big difference for us. So essentially, those are the theological points I wanted to bring out with the events that we just have celebrated. The church will celebrate the events of the Pascha story over and over again. Every Sunday will be dedicated to a certain aspect of the resurrection. Last Sunday, we had the Confession of Thomas. Next Sunday, we will hear again the account of the burial of Christ and the role played by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus and the myrrh-bearing women. So that's why the Sunday is called the Sunday of the myrrh-bearing women, Tomira Forum. And then from there, we go to the Sunday of the blind man. It's an event that took place in the ministry of Jesus, but it refers to the fact that while this man who was born blind is healed, by Christ recreating his eye, because the tradition is that he had no eye in the socket. So when Jesus spits on the ground and makes this, this mud, so to speak, and applies it to the socket, he shows that he is the creator that has created all mankind. And he now recreates the eye for this man who was born without an eye and goes to ask him to go to the pool of Siloam to wash so he could see again. So again, another aspect that this God who has risen is the God who created humanity. The next Sunday, the Sunday of the paralytic, the man who could not walk, and Jesus again raises him up. The Sunday of the blind man is actually the Sunday of the, the last, in fact, Sunday before the 40 days of Pascha, before we celebrate the Ascension. So the next time we meet will be in two weeks, and we'll discuss there the Ascension and Pentecost, and with the, those two important events as the culmination of the Easter and the Paschal celebrations. In other words, whereas Jesus' ministry is fulfilled on the cross with his death, but there's still one thing that has to happen. He needs to enthrone the human nature that he united himself to at the right hand of God the Father, so that now human nature is forever seated at the right hand of God the Father. This is what gives us the understanding that we are called to be everything that Jesus is, that God is, not by nature, but by grace, by the grace of the Holy Spirit. That we are called to be saints. For the moment that we are baptized, we begin that journey of sanctity to the heavens. So, any final questions before we finish off? Yes. 
not on the topic. Wait for the end. Okay, John. Yes. You will see the Son of Man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wait, so, question. Some of the people were making fun of him, asking him, says, if you are who you say you are, come down now from the cross and... and because he hadn't finished his mission. The mission was, he had to die on the cross. He had to taste of death in order to destroy it. It's a theological point, that he had to fill the realm of death with life. And that's why we sing, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and to those in the tombs he has bestowed life. The only way he could bestow life to those in the tombs is by dying himself. But as the hymn state, the author of life could not be held by death. In other words, death is powerless before the author of life, who is Christ. So the the whole point is a theological point that he had to die on the cross, enter the realm of death, and basically shatter its power from the inside and fill this realm with life. And that's what gives us the hope in the life to come that death is no more, as St. John and Chris is a wonderful Chris, the, uh, the sermon, which I love on that night. And in the, in the church, it, the books say that you read it at the end of the service, you know, well, hardly everybody's around to hear it. And it certainly doesn't refer to the, uh, the when it talks about the fatted calf being fatted and, uh, and let's eat and rejoice. It doesn't talk about uh, the lamb and the majerisa way you home for us. It's talking about communion. That's why I read it now as the sermon, which is called to be after the gospel of the liturgy, to prepare people, stay, feast on that fatted calf, who is Christ in communion. All right. Yes. Even the ones at the last hour will welcome you. I'm not going to tell you don't commune. That's between you and God. I would say if you have a sense that you're being called to take communion, and you have this urge that you're being called for it, and there's nothing that uh, condemns your conscience, I would say come, then come and we can do you with the rest of it in confession. Last one. Let's stay on topic and then we'll take yours afterwards. I don't want to go too late. Go. I'm not sure about the timing as well, but we certainly know that uh, it, was, it was just before his, the public ministry of Christ. Remember, Christ begins his